so we gathered together about 30 bulimic kids and their their families and did our structural strategic family therapy and did it pretty successfully i think and despite that uh, a lot of these kids kept binging and purging and so out of frustration i began asking why and they basically taught me this model and uh because they started talking this language of parts which uh up until then i hadn't ever thought of i mean i always thought of myself as having one mind and a bunch of different thoughts and emotions but the idea of having more than one mind i i was seeing as pathological so as they talked about for example this critic inside who called them terrible names and that would trigger a part that made them feel worthless and alone and empty. And then that feeling was so dreadful that almost to the rescue would come in the binge, take them away from that alone, empty, young, worthless feeling. But the act of the binge would bring the critic back, who's calling them even more brutal names like pig now, because they binged. And that would, of course, bring back that empty, worthless, young, lonely part. And so then the binge had to come back to get them away from that. But then the critic came back because they binge and they'd be in that vicious cycle all day. And they were talking about these parts as if they had a lot of autonomy and could make them do things they didn't want to. And they talked about how they related to each other inside. And at first, like I said, I got scared. I thought maybe these these kids are sicker than I thought originally. Maybe they had multiple personality disorder. And then I started listening inside myself and oh my God, I've got them too. And some of mine are as polarized as theirs. And so then I, I got curious and started to experiment and would, you know, ask my client, when the critic attacks you, what do you do? And typically they say, I just believe it, feel bad. Say, so, well, why don't you stand up for yourself? And they'd go home and try that. Or how do you relate to the binge? Well, I, I just let it come. Why don't you fight with it a little? And they'd try that and come back and tell me how things were getting worse. But I was like that man in a hole with a shovel. Uh, I would say, stand up stronger, dig, control more and they just kept getting worse uh, until the first client I was aware of who cut herself on her wrists and had an extensive sex abuse history. And by then I was, uh, I heard about the Gestalt empty chair technique where you could have a client imagine that a part was in a chair across from them and then speak to that empty chair as if the part was there and then they could trade chairs and be the part talking back and and i was hearing about four and five parts so i had lots of chairs in my office clients were hopping all over <clears throat> and so with this cutting part one session i decided we weren't going to let it leave my office until it agreed not to do it to her that week. And of course, after a couple hours of badgering the part, it did say, okay, I'm not gonna do it this week. And I opened the door to the next session and she had a big gash down the side of her face. And that was a turning point in the history of this work because I shifted out of that coercive, we're gonna beat you place to just being purely curious and i asked the part why do you do this to her and it talked about how important it was to get her out of her body when she was being abused as a child and to contain the rage that would get her more abuse and as i heard that i shifted again now i'm not just curious but i have a kind of appreciation for the heroic role it played in her life and I could convey that to the part. And it burst into tears because everybody had demonized it and tried to get rid of it. And 
finally somebody was listening to it. And so, as I said, that was a turning point because from that point on, instead of arguing with or trying to, you know, challenge the irrational beliefs of these parts, I started to get my clients to listen to them and try to have better conversations with them and find out more about why they do what they do and and uh, and take them more seriously. And from all of that, I learned a couple of things. One is that most of these parts weren't living in the present. Like that cutting part, as I listened to it, it was clear it still thought she was five years old and it was still thought she needed this kind of protection. And it was frozen in, that, in the, those trauma scenes. And it carried what we're gonna call burdens. So the definition of a burden is an extreme belief or emotion that came into your system from a trauma or attachment, I mean, attachment injury, and then attaches to these parts, almost like a virus, like the, like the COVID, and drives the way the parts operate. <clears throat> and so it became clear that the parts weren't the burdens they carry, and that they were stuck in the past, like I said. And so as we got that, I just began trying to experiment with ways to fix all that and help them unburden. And ultimately concluded that, first of all, it's the natural state of the mind to have parts, to be multiple in that way, that, that they're all valuable, they, they all have qualities and resources to lend us as we go through life. Uh, I recently wrote a book called No Bad Parts, addressing this whole topic. So we all have parts. It's a good thing to have them. And like kids in a family, which is why it's called internal family systems, they are like, uh, you know, if you have a, a kid in a family who is sensitive and fun loving and playful and creative, but the dynamics of the family are such that that kid has to uh, step into a role that is not that. He has to become maybe a parentified child or he has to protect uh, a family member from another or, and he no longer is, it, is that sensitive, carefree kid. He now is forced into a role that doesn't suit him, but that was necessary in that family. So what I'm saying is the same thing is true with these parts. They're all valuable inner personalities, inner, inner beings that because of trauma or attachment injuries, are forced out of their naturally valuable states into roles that they don't like, but they think are necessary. And, and, and they take in these extreme beliefs and emotions from the traumatic experiences that color the way they see the world and the way they operate. And uh, so that, that's been a tough sell over the years because psychotherapy and our culture does tend to to see parts as the way they present themselves, that the, the critic is really just an internalized critical parental voice where the binge is an out of control impulse. And when you think of them that way, how you have your client relate to them is limited. And, and, and you tend to do what I was encouraging my client to do, which is to ignore them or just distract from them or fight with them. Or, and, and that is still what a lot of psychotherapies do. Uh, so that's the first really important concept that it's natural to have parts. They're not the product of trauma. <clears throat> trauma does tend to blow them apart more and make them more extreme, but that's because it forces them out of their naturally valuable states into roles 
that may have been necessary at one time, but uh, but aren't anymore, but they don't know that. So let me just pause here. I see a couple hands are up. And as we go, I'm going to be checking in to take some questions. So um, looks like uh, Tia. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to sit down from the first time. I didn't have any questions right now. Oh, I'm Thank sorry, you. it's okay. And Jill, are you the same? You don't have any questions? No, no, I don't. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me ask if anybody does have a question. Go ahead and raise your hand at this point. Okay, I guess not. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to assume you all buy this first proposition that the mind is naturally multiple and that that's a really good thing. So uh, then as a family therapist, I became very interested, as I was saying, in improving the relationship between my clients and their parts. Uh, and so I would set up these dialogues at first in the empty chair way, but then I had a client who said, I can just sit here and do it. So it turns out most everybody can just sit there and do it. And so we don't use the chairs anymore much, but uh, I might have a client uh, focus on that critic, which most everybody has at least one version of, and now my goal, because I got hip to the fact that these parts aren't what they seem, and that instead of fighting with them, it's better to, to listen to them, get to know them, hear their stories. So now I'm trying to get my client to do that with this critic. And as I'm having that happen, my client is, is becoming really angry at the critic, and the conversation is breaking down. And it reminded me of family sessions where I'm trying to have maybe a teenage girl talk to her critical mother and have them have a better dialogue. But all of a sudden the girl is furious with the mother. And we were taught to look around the room and see if somebody isn't subtly siding with the girl against the mother. And you often find the father's doing that. And so then you ask the father to move positions in the room out of her line of vision and th thereby improving the boundary around the mother and the daughter. And you do that and she settles down and they have a, a good conversation. I'm thinking maybe the same thing's happening with the center system. Maybe as I'm trying to have my client talk to this critic a part who hates the critic has come in and is doing the talking. And so I began asking clients, could you find that part that's so angry at the critic and just ask it to relax or open space in there or step back. And to my utter amazement, clients would say, okay, you did. And I'd say, now, how do you feel toward the critic? And it would be an entirely different answer where seconds earlier, they hated it and wanted to get rid of it. Now they say some version of, I'm just kind of curious about why it calls me names. Curious, calm, confident, and often even compassionate. I feel sorry for it that it has to do this. And in that place, the conversation with the critic would go very well. And, and it seemed like my client would know exactly what to say and how to would almost take over the session and, and know how to help the critic. And so I started trying that with other clients, uh, asking these other parts to just relax while I had my client talk to the, the target part. And I would, it was like the same, like the same, like the same. Like the same. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing an echo suddenly. I don't know. Okay, I think it's gone now. 
uh, it was like the same person would pop out and with those same C word qualities of calm and confidence and curiosity and compassion. And also I, I began to catalog the qualities after I did this over and over. Uh, and oddly enough, they all began with the letter C. So uh, we have what we call the eight C's of self-leadership. So again, calm, curious, confident, compassion, but the client would also be creative in how it related to the part and uh, courageous in the conversation and uh, would have uh, a desire to connect, connectedness, and then would, would see the part more clearly suddenly. It wouldn't look so menacing and they would see it maybe as a little kid all of a sudden. So those are the eight C's that emerged as qualities of the person who comes forward when all these other parts step back. And then when I'd ask clients, now what part of you is that? They'd say some version of, that's not a part like these others, that's me, or that's myself. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And this is the big discovery of IFS that changes everything basically, because it turns out that that self with all those eight C qualities is in everybody, can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and is just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open space, it emerges spontaneously. And so, and when I ran into it, and I, I would say, okay, maybe these two clients, but could it be in this client too? As I kept doing it and finding it in all these clients, and these clients had horrible histories, many of them, uh, I couldn't reconcile it with what I'd been taught in graduate school, like you had been, which is attachment theory. Because you know, attachment theory, uh, for you to have any of those kind of C-word qualities, you had to have had a certain kind of parenting during a critical period in your childhood. And if you didn't get that, you were out of luck until you got it from a therapist or spouse or something that it had to come from a relationship. It had to come into you from some relationship. And I was working with clients who not only didn't have good enough parenting, but had been tortured on a daily basis as children. There was no way to reconcile this phenomenon that this was there just beneath these parts with attachment theory. And so uh, I started to look around and lo and behold, while almost no psychologies know about this, most every religion has a word for this, most every spiritual tradition, whether it's uh, uh, Buddha nature or Atman or Christ consciousness or so on and so on. I co-authored a book on that whole topic of, of uh, different spiritual traditions, what they, how they see self. So yeah, so that's a big deal that there is this inner essence that, that knows how to heal and can't be damaged and can be accessed often pretty quickly, even in clients who have terrible trauma histories. And when it is accessed, knows how to begin to heal inside. And that's actually very hard to believe. It's, it's you know, until you've done it a few times, uh, it's, you can't just take it from me, but it turns out it's true. And that changes the whole ball game in terms of trauma therapy. Uh, it makes, trauma therapy a whole lot easier. So let me pause with this one now and see if there are any questions or reactions so far. Okay, I'll look at the chat maybe instead of looking for raised hands. Uh, 
Okay. What's the name of the book? Oh, on the nature of the self. It's called um, Many Minds, One Self. And I co-authored it with a guy named Robert Falconer. Uh, okay, I don't see the other questions, so I'll just keep plowing along. So, um, so again, I'm a systems thinker, family therapist, and so I, as I'm learning about these inner systems, I'm looking for distinctions and patterns. And the, the pattern or the distinction that immediately uh, became clear early on was the distinction between parts that were very, very vulnerable and had been locked away in the system. Uh, you know, some people might say repressed. And then the parts that protected them. So I'm going to start with the first class of vulnerable parts. So, you know, we all have these, what other systems might call inner children who are young and uh, when they're not hurt, are very loving and open and uh, intuitive, and creative, and playful, like young children. And they're delightful to have in your life because of all that creative. But when they get, when something bad happens to you, especially when you're young, they're the ones who get hurt the most because they're the most sensitive parts of you. And so they pick up the burden of shame and worthlessness, for example, or terror from the incident, or emotional pain, a sense of, uh, of being abandoned or rejected. All of that comes into that originally young inner child part. And now that it carries those burdens, it has the power to, to make you feel that way if it takes over. And so we have a kind of natural inclination to lock it away inside. And uh, most of us do that. And most of us also are told by people around us to do that, to just move on from the pain or the, the terror and don't look back. And so we all then tend to have a lot of what I call exiles. So again, exiles are these vulnerable parts who just by dint of being hurt or scared or uh, shamed uh, become inner outcasts or exiles. And we lock them away thinking we're just moving on because ours is a rugged individualist culture and we're supposed to just move on, not realizing that in doing that, we're leaving behind our most precious qualities. And we're not nearly the same kind of person after we have these, uh, all these exiles. And when you get a lot of exiles, you feel much more vulnerable and the world feels much more dangerous because so many things could trigger them now. And if, if, they, if an exile gets triggered, it might burst out from where you've got it locked away and these flames of emotion could consume you and make it so you can't function in the outside world. Maybe so you have to be in bed for a week you know, you probably have clients who have had terrible experiences when their exiles took over. Uh, and so to prevent that, a lot of other parts are forced out of their naturally extreme roles into becoming protectors. And they're trying to both protect the exiles so they don't get triggered, but also keep them contained, protect you from them. Some of them 
do that by trying to manage your life so that nothing happens that might trigger the exiles. So we call them managers. It's one class of protector, managers. So they might manage your relationships so no one gets close enough to, to hurt you in any way or manage your appearance so you never get rejected or manage your performance so you get a lot of accolades to counter the worthlessness or they're, they're very into managing things they're into control they're into pleasing people um, and they run our day-to-day -day lives it's what's called the ego or a lot of other systems uh, some of them are critics but they're just yelling at you to try and get you to behave like they take on your your mother's voice because you listen to her so and they're if you ask them what they're afraid would happen if they didn't yell at you all the time you'd learn that they're trying to protect you in some way or some critics are trying to run down your confidence so you don't take any risks so and then there are this is rampant among therapists. There are these caretaking parts that manage everything by trying to take care of everybody. They don't let you take care of yourself. Or, so these are just some of the common roles that these, these managers find themselves in. Uh, but it's important to remember that they're not the role. They're, it's just what they've been forced to do. And that once released from the role, they'll transform into their naturally valuable state, which is often entirely different and often even the opposite of the role they're in. So we all have these parts who are trying to keep us safe that way by managing everything. The world has a way of still triggering our exiles, breaking through those defenses. And when an exile gets triggered, as I said earlier, it's a big emergency because you start to feel what you felt back then when that part got hurt in the first place. And so there's another set of parts who has to immediately go into action to deal with this emergency. We call them firefighters because they're fighting these flames of the exile's emotion. And we all have a, a hierarchy of firefighter activities. So if you do feel triggered, you'll have an impulse to maybe eat something uh, or to uh, text somebody or you know, our culture provides all kinds of firefighter activities. But higher on the hierarchy, you might have an impulse to get high in some form, to get higher than those flames or to in a big way distract yourself. Uh, so we all start out with, if this one doesn't work, we go to the next one. If that doesn't work, we go to the next one. And at the top of that hierarchy for most of us is suicide. It's very comforting to know that if the flames get too hot, there's this exit strategy and you don't have to stick around for the rest of it. And so all of these firefighters are desperately trying to protect also, but often in the opposite way of the managers, because they think if they don't take you away, you're going to die. They often actually believe that. And as I said, they're often stuck back in a time when that might have happened in the past. Uh, and they, they don't care about the collateral damage to your body or your relationships by their activities. They just think they've got to get you away from this right now, regardless uh, of the consequences. So it's a very simple map. You got your managers, your firefighters, both of which are protectors. And they're both trying to deal with your exiles, try to keep them contained and protected. And so trauma survivors, if you have a lot, will have lots of exiles with lots of big burdens. And so their protectors are going to be more extreme as a result. And will often polarize with each other. So the, the description I gave you earlier of a bulimic kid 
who's got the binging firefighter and then the critic who attacks the firefighter for binging would be an example of a polarization between a manager and a firefighter. The manager's trying to keep the client in control and please everybody. And the firefighter's taking the client out of control and pissing everybody off. So there's a kind of built-in battle that's gonna happen. And both of them might be protecting or trying to contain the same exile, but just in opposite ways. So, uh, so that's the, the map to this inner territory that comes with IFS. And uh, let me pause one more time and just see if there are any questions or reactions to this so far. Okay, uh, Sarah. Hi, Richard. Um, sorry, I'll come on camera for a second. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's more of a question. Um, it's quite a specific question. So I've been trying to work in an IFS kind of framework with a lady. I work in a medium secure unit um, with a lady who's got identified parts, and we've we've identified that she's got two two parts that are protectors. One of them, what I, I didn't actually understand. The hierarchy but she's got one that very much is about killing her if she gets too close to recovery because essentially she's got um she's been in hospital since she was 16 years old she's 30 now she's not going to get out probably for quite a long time she's got a family system at home which denies the abuse that happened to her so it's not safe for her to go home essentially now the situation we've got into is every time we get close to working um in any productive way at all and i've been working with her for four years She's got a really violent part um, that basically is so violent that it results in her being secluded. And then when she's in seclusion, I'm not allowed to go in and work with her because she's so violent. So it really affects the work that we're doing and makes it pause. Now, I guess my question is, um, until this, my gut feeling is, until this situation is resolved with her family and it's safe enough for her to be able to leave hospital, I'm not sure that we'll ever be able to get that far with the internal work. We've done quite a lot already, but I just, I mean, this part essentially said to me, I will never allow her to get out of hospital until her mom dies because it's not safe. She'll yeah. be hurt again. Yeah. Yeah. The, the violent part, you mean, said that. To yeah. Me. yeah. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and are you doing what we call direct access with these parts or are you going through her? Do you know what um, I mean? Going through her um, yeah. because, yeah, going through her and I've had some conversations and the, they do seem to be more comfortable talking to me. They wouldn't at all once and the violence did reduce. But then sadly, um, because of the way that services are built, they look at the increase in violence and just look at risk and say, well, the trauma work obviously isn't working. It's making her worse. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, first, let me thank you for the work you do at, you. at an institution like that. It's such tough work and mm -hmm. so needed. I, I really want to support you. Thank you. And yeah, the degree to which you can validate uh, with someone like her, I'm not trying to convince this part that it is safe to leave because it's probably no. not. No, it's not. So my my pitch to a part like that is if you let us heal all these parts that were hurt by the family in the past, so they're just not so vulnerable to the same kind of hurt, then maybe it will be safer to leave. And you can still be the call, make the call on that. You can still be the judge of that. I'm never going to pressure you that way. But would you be willing to let us heal some of these vulnerable parts? Are you still there, Sarah? Sarah shared in the chat that her screen has frozen. Oh, oh boy. Um, Sorry, my screen froze then. OK. But did you hear me? No. Sorry, oh, Sarah. I'll try, I'll try it again. Yeah. So. My pitch to these kinds of protectors, like that violent part, is you're the boss. I'm mm -hmm. not going to pressure you to have her leave and be in danger again. Mm -hmm. But what if we could make it so she's just not so vulnerable to these people yeah. by, he by healing the parts that 
they hurt the past. If we could get those parts out of where they're stuck in the past and help them unburden, then uh, she wouldn't be so vulnerable. So would you allow us to do that much? And then later you can decide whether or not she's ready to leave. Yeah. And in the meantime, you don't have to keep her there by constantly being violent. You can just, we can just negotiate. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for the work. I don't know if you froze when I was saying that, but I, oh, still, no, thank I, I still appreciate the work you're doing. The most traumatized people we have, I think. Absolutely. Well, certainly I've seen in 23 years. I've never seen the levels of trauma that there is in forensic services. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole tragedy of, uh, you know, people like her get hurt terribly. And then hurt others. Mm. And Yeah. And then they've got firefighters that hurt yeah. others. And then they're punished and put in this, these dreadful places. And and their families just keep on going so yeah thank you so much that's so helpful thank you that. you're welcome so any other questions or reactions so far uh katie Yeah, hi. Um, I don't have, well, that I know, I don't have any clients who have, I have seen different parts, um, but I wanted to take this course so I could learn more about it. Um, I just don't know if there's any advice you have for me to, I work with quite a few people who have, who have pretty significant trauma histories, um, but I'm wondering what your advice is for me to be able to better recognize and maybe help those parts feel comfortable expressing themselves. I don't want to like weird clients out if I'm like, hey, do you have other parts? I don't also want to like imply that they have other parts. Yeah. But what is your advice about that? Would you be up for doing a role play right now? Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay, so you're just coming to me with your problem, okay? Okay, okay. So Katie, how can I help you? Um, I'm just having a bit of a difficult time with more anxiety and feelings of helplessness. Okay, so you have these parts that feel helpless and then also parts that get really anxious about it, or maybe it's the same. Mm -hmm. and, and when you feel those parts of you, what else happens inside? Um, I think feeling like a panic or wanting to shut down usually. Okay. So there, there's a panic that comes in one, one part and then some other part comes in and tries to shut everything down or shut you down. Does that sound right? Yeah. And which of those parts typically wins ultimately? Um, I don't know. Um, just be one of your clients. I know. I'm trying to think. Okay. We'll just say the shutdown. Yeah, the shutdown part. And how long does it keep you shut down like that? Um, sometimes like a day. Okay. And what's the worst part of that whole experience you just described? Um, the not being able to then like kind of the spiraling of, well, then I'm a failure. I can't accomplish things okay. that get done. So and... then, the, then these critics come in and call you names. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So if we could change some of that, would you like to start with that, with the, the critics? Yeah. OK, well, we can do that. It's okay. pretty simple. OK. Uh, all you got to do is focus on that critical voice in your mind and tell me where you find it in your body or around your body. Um, sorry, I just want to make a note of that. OK, we can pause here. You're OK. <laughs> Okay. Such a good sport. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate you. And that 
you're so seamless and it's <laughs> so well done. And I've been doing it 40 years. <laughs> the point is though, that in a few minutes, we identified a handful of parts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I use the, the word part and, right. and you didn't, and people don't say, what are you talking about? Right. Because everybody already says, a part of me is wanting to listen to this, right. this class. Mm -hmm. And another part of me wishes I was out, you know, on the beach. Yeah. Okay. So people are okay with the language. Okay. And, and then at some point I'll ask the question that I asked, which is, what of these things we've mentioned do you want to change? What's getting in your way the worst or some version of that? And then I'll, I'll give my, when I, I call myself a hope merchant. So I'll say, well, we can fix that. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. You know, sometimes you, particularly with severe trauma, you need many sessions of just building enough trust to have that conversation and actually get started, but not in some cases. As if we have time, I'm going to show. Yeah. A video. I'll show a video like that. Okay, and then you said um, when you identified. Okay, so you have some critics that come in. Well, we can work on that. Um, and then you said with your critic, if you like slow down and kind of notice that critic part, where do you feel that in your body? Yeah, that's, that's the first step in uh, starting the IFS process. Okay. It's having people shift their focus from the outside world to the inside and just notice. And most people can pretty readily tell you where they find these parts in their bodies or around their bodies. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a good sport. Yeah. Yeah. So once you, once you say, where do you feel that critic in your body? Where do you go from there? I was about to go through that. Okay. <laughs> but let me, let me just check and see if there are any okay. other questions so far. Great. Thank you. Okay. Wayne. That's better. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Um, I, I recently heard a um, IFS therapist speak about how for uh, some people with um, a lot of trauma, they, they're not um, comfortable finding, locating a part in their body, like because there's, I guess, there's a part that wants to disconnect them from their body because that's a place of trauma and pain. Um, yeah. So there's another way, does it like just, just where, how do you notice the part or? It's exactly. Like that. That's exactly right way. Just focus on however, however you notice that. Oh, okay. It doesn't have to connect with the body. You just no, however not, they're aware of it. No, the body isn't mandatory. It, it seems to help because then you have a concrete place to have the dialogue with, but it's not necessary. Okay. And is there, there's a sense which, um, instead of locating the part within ourselves in a way, the sense in which it can kind of be away from us, that we're aware yeah. that the part, yeah. oh, it's kind of outside of us, it's way over there or? Yeah, I'll always say in your body or around your body. Okay. Yeah. So it could, could even be a sense of a distance from your body. Very much, yeah. Um, and then then try to get a bit closer to it or something. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, if, okay. If, you know, if you have permission, yeah. If you have permission, yeah, that's permission. That's an important one. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. So one more, Amy, and then we'll uh, I'll tell you how to do this stuff. Hi, thank you. I'm I'm wondering what's the youngest age range that you um, you work with or you recommend for IFS? I know you were talking about working with um, kids with bulimia and they, but I'm wondering about younger kids and if it works for them too. Yeah, it's, it's delightful to work with young kids down to about age four. They have to be able to talk pretty well. But uh, we use a lot of play therapy technique. So, uh, and, and kids that age can very quickly tell you all about their parts. They haven't been socialized away from the phenomena. So sand tray or puppets or draw your parts or mm -hmm. kids, lo kids love it. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to march on here so we have enough time to watch the video, I hope.
Um, yeah, so you saw how we get it going, processes fight it in your body, and then this, this sort of magic question, how do you feel toward this part of you? How do you feel toward this critic, for example? And answering that question, you're gonna hear from often from parts that are polarized with it. I hate it, or I, I'm afraid of it, or, and then we're gonna ask those parts to open space until we get some version of, I'm, I'm interested, I'm open, I, I wanna get to know it, I might even wanna help it, I care about it. So we get some access to self. And once we get that, then we begin the process of getting to know it, which ask it what it wants you to know about itself or why it's doing this job or, and then there this other big question, ask it what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this inside of you. And in answering that question, it's gonna tell you about what it protects. If, if I didn't do this, you'd get hurt. Or if I didn't do this, you would, you would get drunk all the time. Or if I didn't do this, there's something, it's in some way it's trying to protect you. And once you get that information about what it's protecting, then you come back to it and say, if we could heal or change that, so that your job wasn't, this job of protection isn't needed in the way it is, what might you like to do instead? And you'd be amazed at the answers to that question. It's always valuable and often the opposite of what the role they've been in. And then we'll say, would you give us permission to go to that so we can heal it and, and or change it? And then we'll come back to you. Now, at that point, there's a lot of fear that comes up often about letting you go, especially to exiles, but also to firefighters. So we've learned how to go through all the fears and reassure the parts. And again, I'm a hope merchant. So I'm saying we can handle that one. We can handle that one. Now, would you let us do it? Uh, and we don't do it without permission. We learned that the hard way. But you get pretty good at getting permission. And often in there along those lines is asking these protectors, how old do you think the client is? Not how old are you, but how old do you think she is? Uh, and often you'll get a single digit. They're really stuck back when, when you were very young and think they have to keep doing this. And just the updating, no, she's not five anymore. She's actually 45. She could handle a lot more than she could back then. A lot of times parts don't believe it at first, but once they do, they say, okay, then I can get permission. So we get permission, now focus on this pain or this, this shame. How do you feel toward it? We do that until we get at least curious, maybe even compassion. Let it know that. Often the image of a child emerges how do you feel toward that little girl? Okay. Ask her to let you know what happened to her to make her feel this way in the past and how bad it was. Speaking of a child, that's <laughs> great. Um, and so the client then begins to feel feelings, sees scenes, uh, has somatic experiences related to the where this part is stuck in the past. And you, we do that until the part feels fully witnessed, until, and asking this part, this little kid, if I would say, ask her if she feels like you really get how bad it was now. And if, if she does, then I would say, I want you to go into that scene and be with that little girl the way she needed somebody at the time. And you would do that and maybe even uh, do things for her back there, like you know, push away the perpetrator and take her to a, and just hold her. And, and then at some point, ask her if she's ready to leave that time and place and come to a safe place in the present or a fantasy place of her choice. So that's what we call a retrieval, retrieving these parts from where they're stuck in the past. And once they're retrieved, if they trust they don't have to go back and that you're going to take care of them, 
then we'll ask, ask the part of it's ready now to unload the feelings and beliefs it got from those experiences. And most parts, if they really trust it, will say, yes, it's re they're ready. And ask the part where it carries all that in its body or on its body. And they can identify it's this, this slime on my skin or it's this fireball in my gut or it's this weight on my shoulders. And ask the part what it wants to give all that up to. Light, water, fire, wind, earth, anything else. It's what we call an unburdening. And the part picks the light maybe, okay, have the light shine on this little girl and total let all that out of her body and off her body and let the light take it out. And how's she doing now? Well, she's happy, she wants to play, she feels much lighter. Okay, good, so then tell her if she wants, she can invite qualities into her body that she'll need in the future and see what comes into her. And the stuff comes in, she can identify it. Now she feels really good. And then we bring in all the protectors to see they don't have to protect her anymore. They can start to think about new jobs themselves. And then in subsequent sessions, we work to help the protectors into new jobs. And like that, that's the way it kind of goes. So um, it's really hard to get it by just listening to me describe it. So I, I thought I'd show a video of a client. Uh, this is a guy who uh, was uh, taken away from his parents by protective services when he was two. He was found in a closet with lots of bruises and, uh, and uh, starving and was then in and out of uh, foster homes because he was uh, very aggressive and hard to control and was adopted then finally by a military family. And uh, that was a kind of disaster too. And then wound up in institutions. He was in an institution for like 10 years uh, where he met the therapist who is bringing him to me who, uh, you know, he couldn't even talk hardly back then. So she would just play basketball with him, but he, he attached to her in a big way. And then he got out of the institution and amazingly started a successful business and had a life going pretty well. And then uh, some guy, a colleague was screwing him somehow financially. And he found himself in the middle of the night in his car uh, driving to go and break this guy's legs. And, uh, and then suddenly kind of snapped out of it and took an off ramp, but it scared him a lot. So that's the issue he's bringing to me. Do you follow all of that? Okay. Let me, let me hope that we can get this going here. Doesn't know anything about IFS, which is partly why I'm showing this. And I was able to just realize it just wasn't worth it, that he's not worth my time, you know? So, so I guess in that respect, it helped me decide ultimately that I definitely wasn't going to do anything hmm? physical to him. That's right, yeah. Well, he sounds like the kind of guy that, you know, I can understand. Right, right. And something to. Right. Um, but the part of you that really wanted to, that did take over and was driving, how's it going with that part now? You know what I'm asking? Um, you mean the way I felt? and? Yeah, the part of you that really wants to hurt him, now that you've decided not to do that, do you still have that sense of that part of you in there, or is it kind of... It's still there, it's just, um, it's a different tactic. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to use, you know, I mean, he's, you know, I could probably find 25 people that he sued over the last three years, or threatened to sue. Um, um, so we're going to, you know, I'm going to have every, I'm going to get everybody together and see if I can do a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. against him, mm -hmm. or go to the New York Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. Better Business Bureau, FTC. Um, a diff completely different tactic to revenge, if you would. And I don't right. even know if it's revenge. I just feel like somebody needs to stop right. him from doing what he's doing. Yeah. And I feel like everybody else is completely intimidated by him. 
and I'm not, so yeah. I'm just going to use a different tactic. Okay, sounds good. So the aggression, the physical aggression part, and the wanting to harm him physically isn't there, but I still feel like somebody needs to stop him. Yeah. And I feel like everybody else is scared to do it, so okay. I'm going to do it. So, um, do you know anything about the kind of work I do? I don't at all. Okay. So I help people with parts that have they have trouble controlling, and so if you're interested, we could try to get to know that one that did take over and was going to hurt them, and see what we can do to help it, because it sounds like what you've done so far is kind of talk it out of that, right. and get it to relax and trust you more. Right. Does that sound right? Sure. But it still would have probably that hair trigger reaction in a similar rea situation. Right. Does that sound right? Sure. So if you're interested, that's one of the things that we could we could do that okay. would be helpful to you? Sure. I'm not sure exactly what it is um, or why I you know, had such an extreme emotion that way. I don't. Yeah, but that's what we find out. This is right. a kind of internal process that okay. you don't have to think about it. We just go in and we ask sure. some questions. Okay. And then the information starts to come out. Okay. But it does involve a kind of inner focus for a period of time. Sure. How does that sit with you, that idea? I'm comfortable with it, sure. You game for that? Okay. All right. So I'll lead the whole thing. I mean, there's not a lot you have to figure out. Okay. All you got to do is what you're doing, which is to get comfortable. Okay. And uh, so see if you can remember that impulse. If you can remember the desire to really hurt him. Okay. And. Uh, as you do, see where you find that feeling, that part of you in your body, around your body. Okay. Do you have a sense of it? I do. Where do you find it? Right in my heart. Right in your heart, yeah. As you notice it there in your heart, Jake, how do you feel toward that part of you that wanted to hurt him? Do you like it, or do you, are you afraid of it, or do you respect it, or... Do you um, want to get rid of it? How do you, what's your Like relationship? I need to protect it. You want to protect your heart. Okay. So does it feel like that, that violent part is trying to protect your heart? Does yes. that sound right? Right. Okay. So your heart is pretty vulnerable. Right. And this violent part is really trying to protect it. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. So as you know that about this violent part, how do you feel toward it, knowing it's really trying to protect your heart? Um, say that question again? Yeah, so. good. So, as you get that this violent part is trying to protect the vulnerability in your heart, right. how do you feel toward this violent part? Um, like it's a protector. Yeah. And knowing that, how do you do you value it and like it or Absolutely. Okay. So this might seem a little odd to you at this point, but I'd like you to focus on it and just let it know you value it and you you appreciate its attempts to protect you. Okay. And just see how it reacts to that appreciation. Okay. And if it helps to close your eyes you can do that, but it, you don't have to. It's up to you. Okay. So just go in inside, focus on it, and in this inner world just convey that appreciation to it. Okay. You don't have to say anything out loud. It's just just let it know that you value how hard it's worked to try and protect your heart. And just see how it reacts to that protection, that, that appreciation. Okay. Do you get a sense of a reaction? Comfort. It feels comforted right. to be valued by you. Right. Okay, good. That's really good. And as you're doing that, see if there's anything more it wants you to know about itself. And don't think of an answer. Don't try and figure out the answer. Just wait for something to come back to you. Just ask it if there's anything else it wants you to know about its, its attempts to protect or its violence. Just see if anything comes. <clears throat> Nothing? Just pretty much reassuring me that it's there to protect. Yeah, that's right. 
So it's just letting you know if, if it's needed, it's there and it's going to do what, what it needs to to protect you. How does it feel to hear that from you? Good. Safe. It's good. Yeah, it makes you feel safe. So it's, it's kind of comforting to know that it's, it's available if necessary. Right. Yeah. Okay. Maybe ask it, what was it like for it to take over that way the other night? And what was it like for you, for it to have you take that exit? Just ask what, what that was like for it. For it to take over, meaning? Well, it got you in the car and you were... Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. And then I kind of took the reins away from him. And yeah, so that's what I'm exit. asking. Right. What was it like for it to take over and then have you kind of pull the reins away? Right. Just ask it that. I guess it, um, it felt like it needed to take over for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, it, was a, it should have felt like, like I was powerless. Yeah. And I couldn't protect myself. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it had to step in and take over, you know? That's right, of course. Um, and then it was completely okay with me take pulling the reins back. And, so know. kind of was relieved that you took over? Not relieved, but just, you know, I can have the reins anytime I want. Okay. So you can see in just a few minutes, about nine minutes, we know about uh, the big protector and also we got a glimpse of this powerless guy, this, this exile. I'm going to run it forward because uh, we don't have that much time. Uh, I go through a number of protectors trying to get permission to, to have him work with this powerless guy. So I'm running it forward about 10 minutes. Sure. Yeah, so let's do that. Just tell the part to take you right there. So 17 or 18 years behind locked doors. Tell to let you feel and sense and know everything about how bad that was and how powerless he felt. Okay. Is there a particular age that's coming or is it the whole time period? exactly how old I was. I guess it's something that I think about periodically. And I guess for some reason it was a time in my life where I probably felt the most vulnerable, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's pretty. I'm good for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 
was adopted by these military people. And they uh, were stationed in Guam. And I think I was in Guam, and I think I think it was I think it was called the Yale Psychiatric Institution. And I think I was like three or four years old. I think it was a very early age. Mm -hmm. And it was my first mental institution. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember. I'm sure I remember this. But I don't know if it was the first day I was there or not. But I, I have this vivid. Um, memory of so I'll tell you what I remember okay. I'm pretty sure it was the first day I was there and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Book took me there and I had this <coughs> this, uh, this bear I call it honey bear and I don't remember not having the bear. I remember always having the bear. It was like uh, the only thing that I had that was consistent. Mm -hmm. So I always had this bear. And uh, I remember like literally going to this mental institution first day and I, I feel like I was immediately put in a seclusion room mm -hmm. upon going into this, this I don't know what you mean, I call it a nut house mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I vividly remember being put in this seclusion room and I'm holding on to the the ear <laughs> the yeah. ear of my honey bear. Yeah. And they wouldn't let me out of it. Oh my god. And they were taking it away. Yeah. And I remember holding on to it and I wanted them so bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember it coming out of my grip. Mm. And they just shut the seclusion room door. And I was there and I was alone. Yeah. <laughs> It was all I had. That's right. That's they right. took it away. That's right. And I didn't know why I was there. <laughs> so, Jake, Jake, how do you feel toward that three or four year old boy right now? I don't know. How do you feel toward him? You should see him there. How do you feel toward him? I feel terrible. You feel terrible for him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to go into that scene in that cell, that room, and be there with him and what he needed somebody. So just tell me when you're in there with him. Okay. Okay, you're there? <coughs> yep. How are you being with him? The way a three-year-old boy would, happy and um, just happy to have you there. Right. Okay. And just see what he needs you to do with him or for him back there before we take him out to a safe, comfortable place. If there's anything he needs you to do with him or for him. Somebody to. It was to stay with them. Are you willing to do that? Yes. So tell them you're going to be staying with them. You're going to be taking care of them now. Let's see how he reacts to that idea. Okay, so from other people. 
in his life. Yeah. Yeah. And then everybody's abandoned him. Yeah. Yeah, except maybe Liz or a few other people. Right? I'm sorry? I said except maybe Liz and a few other people. Right? Well, I didn't. Yeah, but at that time I was... He didn't know her at that time. Right. So he's heard it from a lot of people. So it's hard for him to trust. Foster homes and... Foster homes, yeah. It's hard for him to trust even you when you say you're going to take care of him. Yeah, it just sounds like... Like anybody else. heard it before, you know? Yeah. Like everybody says that... Yeah. They're going to be there for you and then... Right. Nobody ever was, you know? Okay. So let him know you can understand his skepticism. Right. Okay? Okay. But, Jake, how do you feel about taking care of him? Are you willing to earn his trust? Sure. So let him know that. He can take his time in trusting you, but you're going to work to earn his trust. And see how he reacts to that. Okay. How does he react? You have to say that again. I kind of went somewhere else for a minute. Okay. <laughs> so there's a part that took you out for a second? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. Yes, for sure. Yes. Let's ask that one to step back to and just let us finish. Okay, sure. We're just not going to take a lot longer. Okay. Okay? So go back to him in that scene, in the hospital, in that room. Right. And you're with him. Okay. And how would you feel about showing up for him? on a consistent basis, in this way. Well, if I'm, you know, if I've made up my mind to, to be there for him, then that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so, <laughs> so I guess are you willing it. to make up your mind to do that for him? <laughs> That's where it took me somewhere else. Um, oh, right. Okay. Let's put it this way. Are you willing to work with the parts that might not want you to do that so that you could do that? Um, I mean, I'm more than willing to do it, for sure. You know, with Liz's help and other people's help, if you need it. Um, absolutely. So let him know that. That you get that he wouldn't trust this right now, and it's okay. You understand? Right. But that you're going to work to prove him, to earn his trust. Okay. Just see how he reacts to that. I mean, yeah, it's okay. You can be as skeptical as he needs to be. That's understandable. Let's see if he would be trusting enough to leave that time and place with you and come to a safe, comfortable place with his honey bear. <laughs> He'll go anywhere with his honey bear. <laughs> ready to go? Just make sure. Or if he needs anything else back there before we take him out. It's up to him. Um, sure. Okay. Sure he's ready to go? Go where specifically again? <laughs> Wherever he wants to go. Yeah, we didn't mention a specific oh, place. wherever he wants to go, yeah. It's wherever he would like to go. <laughs> could be in the present, could be a fantasy place, could be a time in your life that was safe. It's wherever he would like to go. 
Absolutely. He's ready to go? Sure. So let's take him wherever he would like. Feel good to him? Just tell me when you're there with him. Okay. Where do you have him? Um, I don't know if it's a place, it's more of a, a place in his heart, in his mind, sure just thing. a place where people care and people yeah. are there forever, un mm -hmm. unconditional love, I guess. Perfect, perfect. So he's there now? Right. How does he like it? Still a little skeptical and afraid, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. better than the seclusion room, of course. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so we take him there, and uh, ultimately he does trust enough to what I call unburden and feels a lot better um but you know this is about I, I wanted to save some time for reactions and questions so uh, this is a, a good example of how it works with trauma and uh yeah anybody have a reaction or question If he wasn't able to be okay with this safe place, what would you do? If he couldn't find a, oh, oh, yeah. oh if he, if we got him to a safe place, but he wasn't okay with it, is that what you're asking? Yes. So if he tried to put him to the safe place, but that part just was like, I'm not comfortable yet, what would you do? We would ask why, and then we would try to make it better for him. It's pretty rare that that happens because he's choosing it. But uh, yeah, you could just see what else he needed or if he needed to try a different place or if he was afraid to not go back. There's a variety of uh, reasons that might be the case. Anybody else? Hey, Dick. Thanks for, really thanks for today. I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. Um, so I find that a lot of times I'll do uh, some interventions that are, uh, you know, we'll start to do this where we contact these different parts. And then the next session, it's almost like they'll reset and not want to go back to do that's that. Right. That's right. Is that, is that, that's pretty common. It's very common. Um, particularly when you did get to an exile, like in this case, with someone who, you know, has spent his whole life trying to stay away from that, that little guy, uh, then there's what we call backlash. And on a, on a good day, I'll predict it, you know, uh, at the end of the session, I think I said, uh, you know, you were pretty vulnerable here, and you may find that there are parts that come and try to erase the whole memory of what happened or or make you feel bad for having been so open. And just know that for what it is, it's very common and next session we'll work with them if they're there. And, uh, and, and you know, they just need a lot of reassurance that you're not judging them, you're not gonna abandon them, you're not, you know, all those things that they predict aren't gonna happen. Uh, does that help, Ace? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Emerald. Hi there. 
Um, I'm wondering how, like, if you have you worked with this gentleman afterwards, and how is he doing now? Was he able to? Was that part able to learn trust and kind of what that looked like in following sessions? Yeah, uh, you know, this was a consult session, and uh, I did two more consult sessions. I have videos of those also. Uh, but in the meantime, his therapist learned IFS and, and was working with him with his parts too. And uh, he's doing great. Yeah, that that little boy's doing good. It's all good. This this video was about I think it's about three years old. So we have quite a long follow up with him. Katie again. Yeah, thank you. So after he goes to that place with the little boy and is with them, how do you finish this session? Do you just have a part of him stay there with the little boy always? I, 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 ideally, ideally, his self will stay there or will visit him during the week, depending on what the boy needs. So there is homework that goes with this. Okay. Uh, so the session is just one element but yeah uh, what i'll tell people is on a daily basis i want you to check with that boy and make sure he's okay to see if he needs anything or needs you to know more or whatever for about a month and if you okay. do that it's gonna, it's gonna stick so okay thank you welcome uh allison Hi, Richard. Thanks so much. I'm really enjoying this. Um, I've been working with someone for several years who uh, I'm a gestalt ther therapist primarily. I work with a lot of sand play and um, art therapy. And uh, a woman, the woman has a, a long history of trauma from early childhood and um, a, a subsequent long-term eating disorder and within that treatment there was a lot of re and uh, she is now at the point she has um, escaped that cycle and has a child and she's doing really well and she's starting to build connections like she's been very isolated and through the, the child that she's now, her son, she's able to start making connections in the community and through the parts work that we've done, there's been a lot of integration of the trauma and we're now kind of, um, well, I'm now noticing that the grief is starting to emerge of what uh -huh. she's actually, you know, nice. endured for her life, right. which is, you know, pretty uh, typical. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you might talk a little bit about grief work with, with long-term clients like this. Yeah, as you say, it's very common. Uh, once st they start to feel better, then they'll look back at all the years they lost. And there is a, a lot of very legitimate grief. And so very similarly to go to the parts that are grieving and be with them in a comforting, loving way in the same kind of fashion. It's not, not all that different. But to not see it as a problem, it's just natural which it sounds like you do. Thank you. And I've got a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. So, uh, Kirsten. I've got to unmute Kirsten. I think you're still muted. Afraid I still can't hear you. So let's go to Vasu. Hi, Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for the wonderful session. I have one quick question. I have a fearful part, which I'm trying to get access to therapists and myself. And, you know, something happened when I was very young, but the part doesn't say what happened. I'm not, the part is not able to answer my question. Like, yeah. What happened? How do you address that kind of a situation? Yeah. So, uh, either the part that's stuck back there is afraid to show you, it's much more likely that there are protectors that are afraid you can't handle it. And so they would be the ones to check in with and 
ask what they're afraid would happen if they did let you see what happened and just negotiate with them and remind them that you're not that age anymore, that you can handle a lot now. And uh, sometimes they'll let you see it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Raquel, absolutely the last question. If you can unmute. Hi, I'm, I'm just wondering, often um, a lot of our training, I'm a CBT therapist and well, eclectic therapist, I guess, but we, we were trained about not flooding clients and obviously in this in this session right um he's brought right back into that spot that could we've often maybe been told that's flooding a client or bringing them too much or yeah. i'm just wondering like i um internal family systems um viewpoint or concept about flooding or if even that's a thing yeah um i'm glad you asked and this is very different from not only cbt but most therapies that worry about that window of tolerance and how much is too much and so on. It turns out that what I'm calling self has an enormous window of tolerance. So if I can get people in those eight C's, they can handle most anything. And I, once I get them there, I don't really worry about it. You know, occasionally I might say, is this okay or is it too much? But almost always they say it's okay. So the whole window of tolerance thing is based on systems that don't know about self. So anyway, I enjoyed meeting you all and uh, good luck. I've got to run, I've got another appointment. Thank you.